now on BBC Two to cover all the latest moods and moves from the Barnsley East by-election. Good morning and welcome to this by-election special edition of the Midnight Hour. We've just had the result of the by-election in Barnsley East that was caused by the death of the Labour MP Terry Patchett. Before we give it to you, just to say this is the fourth safest Labour majority in Britain, with a majority at the last election of nearly 25,000. There hasn't been a safer by-election for 25 years, uh, and this is in a coal mining community in South Yorkshire. There's been interest in the challenge from Arthur Scargill's Socialist Labour Party with its candidate, who's a former vice chairman of the NUM in Yorkshire. Uh, there have been interest in how the Tories do, of course, and how the Liberal Democrats do. And if uh, Labour has won, I'm not proposing to give you the result at this early stage of the evening, we'll have it in a moment, the Conservatives will lose their majority over the other parties in the House of Commons. There'll be a zilch, zero majority, 323 members on the Conservative side and 323 members on all the other parties put together on their side. So with me to chew over the result, to talk about the consequences of this first loss of the Tory majority for 18 years, are John Prescott, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Lord Archer, the author Geoffrey Archer, of course, a former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, and Chris Davis for the Liberal Democrats, who won the by-election last summer at Littleborough and Saddleworth. Now, let's, uh, without any more ado, hear the result from Barnsley East. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attendance, please? I have a declaration for you of the result of this election. I, Michael Brendan Kenny, being the acting returning officer at the election of a Member of Parliament for the Barnsley East constituency held on 12th December 1996, do hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at the election is as follows. Capstick, William Kenneth, Socialist Labour, 949. <laughs> Ellison, Jane Elizabeth, Conservative, 1,299. Ennis, Jeffrey, Labour, 13,683. <laughs> Island, Julie Eleanor, Socialist Equality, 89. <laughs> Tolstoy and Nikolai, UK Independence, 378. Willis, David Grant, Liberal Democrat, 1,502. The number of ballot papers rejected was 28, and I do hereby declare that the said Geoffrey Ennis is duly elected a Member of Parliament for the Barnsley East constituency. Thank you, colleagues. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Returning Officer, all week we've read about the confusion in trying to determine which Conservative MPs still support the government. After 17 years, everybody, everyone has been looking at the dwindling Tory majority. They think it's all over. It is now. I would like to thank the Acting Returning Officer and his staff and the police for doing such an efficient job today. I want to thank my agent, Tony Slatcher, and all the party members and supporters who have worked so hard in the cold weather to achieve such an excellent result. 
This is the night that Barnsley East and the people of the coalfield communities who have, who have suffered so much at the hands of this Tory government have spoken on behalf of the whole community to say to John Major and his appalling government, enough is enough. So there he is, Jeff Ennis, who won for Labour with no particular surprise in the victory. But what about what happened within that uh, pattern of voting? Peter Snow's got all the figures of all the candidates and can show us how it differed from the general election of 92. Right, and it really isn't a bad result for Labour, bearing in mind that this is a huge drop in turnout, 33.7% turnout, a 40% drop in the general election, very nearly a record low turnout, and yet Labour managed to do pretty well, uh, and the Tories are down here. So here we have this uh, safe Labour seat in Barnsley East, in the middle of the South Yorkshire coalfield as was. Now there are no mines left in East Barnsley. Labour had 13,683. There's Jeff Ennis's winning score, way ahead of the Liberal Democrats who take second place from the Conservatives. The Tories were second last time. There's David Willis in second place for the Liberal Democrats. The Conservatives, 1,299, Jane Ellison uh, and Ken Capstick of uh, Arthur Scargill's Socialist Labour Party on 949. Uh, not quite such a big score as uh, they scored in Hemsworth in February. Uh, there we are holding the seat then with a 12,181 majority in a safe Labour seat. Now what about the share of the vote uh, in Barnsley East? Well here it is, a socking great mountain of votes here, 78% for Labour, more than three quarters of the vote going to Labour, leaving the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives way behind there, 9% the Liberal Democrats, 7% the Tories and 5% the SLP coming in there for the first time, just holding on to their deposit. Now the change this represents uh, on the general election of 1992 as you can see, Labour really just about holding their vote. A tiny drop in the Labour uh, share there of the vote, 0.6 percent points down. Liberal Democrats just a tiny bit down. It's the Tories who've dropped, uh, nearly 7 percent down. And bear in mind that's 7 percent compared to 14 percent, so they've actually halved their share of the vote. The Tories are whoppingly down, really. 6.7 may not look like very much compared to Staffordshire South East, where they lost 22 percent of their vote in percentage points, but they've actually halved their share of the vote. And there we have the SLP for the first time coming in at 5.3%. So let's go now into the House of Commons and see, this is not a forecast, this is the actual state of play in the House of Commons in terms of voting power. Neil Kinnock's Labour Party, 271 at the general election. Now it's Tony Blair's. Allow for uh, the by-election gains. Allow also for the fact that uh, two Labour Party MPs have to go and be non-voting members of the House of Commons, the officials of the House of Commons. 271 is Labour's voting power in the House of Commons. Along now to look at Paddy Ashdown's Liberal Democrats. 20 at the general election. Six more because of uh, desertions from the Tories uh, and because of by-election wins, making 26 altogether the best-sized Liberal Democrat Liberal Party we've had in the House of Commons in recent memory. 24 others plus one, the Perth and Kinross win by the SNP, making the voting power of the opposition look like that. Now over to the Tory side of the House. Here we have John Major then in 1992 coming into power with a working majority, 336 through the winning post, 336. Over the last five years, they've been whittled down by by-election losses, by desertions to Labour and the uh, uh, Liberal Democrats, down to just one above the winning post there, 323 then, 323 to three, the opposition's 322 before tonight. And there's John Gorst in the middle there, representing the person who gives them the 323 over 322 score. Just one technical majority for the Tories, but of course he said that he would not, not be relied on, he was not to be relied on, but because he gave the impression over the weekend that he would vote for the Tories in the vote of confidence, we've added him to the Tories score 323. So 323 to 322. Now, in comes the Barnsley East winner, Jeff Ennis, joining the Labour Party over there, 323 to 323. That's assuming John Gorse, of course, votes with the government. And there you have it, no overall majority. David. Peter, thank you very much. Well, in a moment, we'll go over to Barnsley East. Just before we do, a first quick reaction to this. John Prescott, the Tories now have no majority. But what does it mean for Labour? What can you do? Can you get an early election, or are you just bound to sit there through till the spring? Does it actually no. make any difference at all? Oh, it does. I mean, now that the government's majority is gone in that sense, what we've got to move is to the Whittle by-election. That's very important, of course. 
Um, the government added, gave all the indications they may have been holding it, holding it in December. It fell apart from them. We'll be pressing very, very hard indeed now to see that the people in the Wirral have a right to be elected can you by force, a Can you government. force a by-election in the Wirral? There are circumstances. Well, there are certain conventions you... about it. One can't do anything really for three months. You can force a vote if you want, but I think we all generally observe that. That would end by about February the 1st. And then, of course, you can have a vote. And indeed, uh, the parties in the House of Commons, they could make a decision that the will people should be able to have that vote. But in the meantime, we'll be pressing very hard for the government to give a date on that uh, by-election. And, and one other thing, do you see any hope of a vote of confidence going against the government? Or it's... Uh unlikely. I, obviously it depends upon the issue of course and no doubt an awful lot of time will be spent with the Ulster Unionists. I mean this business about the calling for the cows is, again can be shown to be connected to what is wanted in Northern Ireland so I think the government are going to be very desperate depending upon the Northern Ireland Unionists to keep them in power. Okay. Now government can't sustain itself very long under those circumstances. Now Geoffrey Archer the Tory vote halves, the budget went badly, the opinion polls are going wrong, what looked as though it might be a pickup in Tory support seems to be falling apart again on, on the basis of tonight. What, what can the Tories possibly do between now and May? Can I start by congratulating Mr Ennis on becoming a Member of Parliament? And secondly, say to uh, remind uh, John, who, whose memory is amazing. I've known him 30 years. Uh, even to get him to say good evening to you is amazing when you stare at him straight in the face. Oh, Don't be finished, John. It's all, right, no, no, John. It's all right, John. It's all right, John. It's all right, John. It's all right. We've got used to it after 30 years. <laughs> But what he also has well, forgotten... When was he meant we to say good evening to you? I've been no, 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 I'm only teasing him. I'm only teasing him. I'm only teasing him. <laughs> I'm only teasing him. But now we are all forced to say good evening to each other, and then we can me, carry on. Allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Allow me to well, if you get moving, wasn't too it would help us a bit. No, fine. Serious. No. Now, could you take the memory? John, don't talk the whole evening, John. I watched you on Newsnight and you didn't stop and let anyone else speak. Let someone else have a You have the conch, Lord Archer. Use it. Now, listen. When you first entered the House of Commons... Keep on giving the parcels out. You see what he did? No, but just he just cannot <laughs> keep his mouth shut for two minutes. Lord Archie, he's just capable. Just, just Jeffrey will do. Don't, don't get pompous. Don't, don't, no. he's not in the there he's off again. Anymore. He's off again. Don't, you if can't I might say so, don't provoke him. Don't, don't provoke oh, sorry. him. Don't just, provoke just speak about no, Tories and answer the question I asked you. Because <laughs> the Liberal Democrats will have a turn otherwise. Yes, indeed. Instead. Quite rightly so. What I wanted to remind John of was that when this last happened, it was under a Labour government, and they lasted 14 months with 17 votes against them. So the idea that there will be a sudden removal of the Conservative Party, that's the first joke, because we have a 51 majority over Labour. And that's the important thing to remember. Now answering your question. Now what are you going to do? Answering your question. Well, I thought you'd take the first part. This was a 30, no one pretends, even someone with John's immense experience, no one pretends that 33% has got anything to do with a general election. The average parish council election is about 33%. Now, the answer to what's got to be done, John hit it on the nose. He said, we're not, we're, we're not working together. We're divided. He's 100% right. If we go into this next election as divided as we are today, we will lose and deserve to lose. We've got to pull together and realise after what John said on television this evening, he wants a minimum wage, though he didn't tell us what it was. He wants the social chapter. He probably wants a single currency. And we've got to realise that is the enemy, not our own side. And if we don't pull together, he's quite right. We'll be beaten. OK. Chris Davis. Well, I'm delighted that the Liberal Democrats, of course, have uh, leapfrogged the Conservatives to come second in this by-election. It's not a by-election we expected to win, of course. It's the fourth safest Labour seat in the country. We haven't got a single Liberal Democrat councillor in the constituency, but uh, our votes held up well. And uh, I think it's uh, very obvious that uh, the Conservatives are the, the main losers of this by-election. OK, well, let's, we have a, a moment more to talk later on. Let's go down to the count now and join Carolyn Quinn, who's with Victors and Defeated. Carolyn? Yeah, David, there was a bit of a flurry of activity here earlier on about the turnout, because in one area they were saying that the turnout was only about 11%. Now, as we know, it's a bit higher than that, 33%, and just slightly lower than the past by-election in Hemsworth. But the interesting thing, I think, during this campaign has been the campaigning style. You've got socialist Labour who are holding old-style meetings, party meetings in church halls, and new Labour campaigning with Jeff Ennis, their campaigner, although he was using the title Common Sense Labour. Well, I've got Jeff Ennis here, the victorious candidate. Now, Jeff, you seem to have achieved your ambition of making this a historic day for Barnsley. Very much so, and I'm, I'm pleased for the people of Barnsley East. They had an opportunity, a window of opportunity here to send a message loud and clear to John Major after 17 years of Tory misrule, and they've grabbed that opportunity. 
But I can't think of a constituency that's been more disadvantaged under John Major's um, government. We've wiped out his majority and we're very proud of that in Barnsley East. Do people realise the importance of that though? I think so, yes. Um, it, it is an historical moment for Barnsley East. We are sending a clear message to the rest of the country and I would hope that John Major would take up the challenge and allow the, the people of Wirral South the same opportunity that the people of Barnsley East have had here tonight. No, we don't know when that by-election is happening. But if it's so clear, why are you calling yourself Common Sense Labour and not New Labour? Are you a bit ashamed of New Labour? Definitely not. I mean, New Labour is Common Sense Labour as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's not what Tony Blair calls it though, is it? I think, I think it's the actual values that New Labour promotes, which are common sense. It's about developing a one-nation society rather than alienation and exclusion, which the Tories have fostered for the last 17 years. But it was a bit of a, a shoe in if I might say, for you. Any surprises at all during this campaign? No, definitely not. Obviously, we're slightly disappointed with the turnout, but there are very good reasons why the turnout is low. Uh, we're working on the old register. Um, the weather was bad. It's close to Christmas and we had a power cut to compound the felony tonight. OK, well, look, let's pass on to Dave Willis, the Liberal Democrat candidate. Now, you must have done far better than you possibly expected during this. In fact, uh, Chris Davis there earlier was just saying that he was almost surprised at the result. We've led an excellent campaign in this by-election, uh, challenging both the Conservatives and the Labour Party on their record. Not only the Conservative government with their atrocious record in government, but also Labour Party uh, locally, where they treat war pensioners so disgracefully. All right, well, you've moved up into second place this time. You must have had a, a real think about what happened after Hemsworth when you didn't manage to do that. So was the campaign very different this time? What was very clear in this campaign was that there were two issues that we ran with very strongly that people from who previously had voted Labour and Conservatives um, identified with. The fact that they distrusted both the Conservatives and Labour parties with um, voting for tax cuts at a time when people want more investments in schools, jobs and more police and in their hospitals. Uh, and also the fact that people are so ashamed of uh, Barnsley Council's local policy of uh, taxing war pensioners. OK, so there you've attacked Labour and the Conservatives. Let me bring in Jane Ellison, the Conservative candidate. Now, there we are. You're, you're, you're hearing from the Liberal Democrat candidate that people just don't want what you're offering. Surely it must have been very difficult for you to campaign in an area like Barnsley East, which is so staunchly Labour. Not at all. The campaign has been a real pleasure and we have sought to raise positive issues about the bright future that this area has. But what very bright much, future? I mean, very much talking the area up in terms of the massive inward investment that is going into this area and the great skills base that this area has. I have to say the most disappointed man of all tonight must be Tony Blair because it's the second personality poll that he's failed in this evening. 33.7% is a derisory turnout in a campaign that New Labour painted as a ringing endorsement for their policies. Well, I'm sure they'll say that the turnout will change in the general election. For the moment, thank you, candidates, and thank you, Jeff Ennis. Back to you, David. Just before we go on, uh, John Prescott, uh, do, do you feel sympathetic for people who won't say New Labour and call it Labour, common sense Labour instead? No, just do you feel a, there's a sort of element in the Labour Party no, that isn't quite getting home there? No, no, uh, just a great candidate there. They teamed very well, and they did very well, and they put over traditional values in a modern setting. It's something I've often called for, and it's indeed what Tony Blair calls, and we call it New Labour. It's a making an identity with traditional values. He and won't I think call he it got new it over labor. He calls it common sense labour. Well, he I, won't call I, it I, new labour because it doesn't go I, down well. Well, I was over up there quite often during the campaign, of course, and it's the first time I've heard common sense. Jeff uses new labour. He talks about traditional values of labour. We did it there. But it's the first time, I must admit, I've heard the sense. Common sense, sense labour. I don't think oh, he's well. used it. It might have been just come out of that interview, but <laughs> basically we used the new can, care campaign. And, you know, we did well there. There's one thing you thought about. You know, that capstick vote for the Socialist Labour Party, that's a thousand votes. If you add that to Labour's as well, we've done really well with Thank the you. percentage share of the vote. Let's, uh, let's have a look at the um, standing of the parties, Peter, in the light of this, and, and at the, how the Tories might recover, and then we'll ask Geoffrey Archer about well, that. What have what the, what the, the Tories got to hope for in terms of public support at the moment? I mean, they look to the polls, everybody looks to the polls, the polls simply offer them nothing. If you look right back, three years back to January 94 and look at the raw unadjusted poll figures it really has stayed that way that socking great 20 percent 25 percent 30 percent sometimes gap between the two main parties with the Liberal Democrats dragging along there down at the bottom looking at the moment rather visible on 14 percent 
Now, even when you look at the adjusted poll figures, adjusting perhaps for any shyness that may be on the part of Tories to admit they're going to vote Tory or whatever it is, even then, although the lines are a bit closer together, you've still got a gap that's something like 20%. It's quite unprecedented in recent political memory to have a gap like that right the way up to five months before a general election, and it does make it look pretty desperate for John Major. But there is one other thing the Tories look to with some hope. They say that when you look, and they of course are right because the University of Plymouth Election Centre does suggest that it's a little bit better for the Tories than the poll figures, that when you look at local by-elections and compare them with the previous elections and do lots of analysis, you get a projected national share suggesting that Labour are not 20% ahead, but only 14% ahead of the Tories. 44, 30, 21 the Liberal Democrats. So you have your choice. You have the polls or you have local by-elections, real people voting in local by-elections. That's one thing. Then, of course, as David said, there is the other measure of public opinion, the feel-good factor, as we call it, the difference between optimists and pessimists when they're asked what they think of the economy in the year ahead. Now, again, two years ago, 20% more people were pessimistic than optimistic about the economy. But look how that moved up. In spite of the fact the Tories dragging along there at the bottom in the polls, the feel-good factor seemed to perk up over the year between January 95 and 96, up to minus 5%, looking much better, until October this year, just before the budget, actually suddenly leaping up here and looking as if it was going through the top with the optimists having the majority over the pessimists. But then, after the budget, the latest Gallup snapshot and Mori this morning in the Times, a fall away again, and the Tories now not benefiting, it looks as if they're not anyway, from the feel-good factor. It's down there at minus 15%, a huge drop in the last month. Maybe that's a bit wrong, but we have Mori and Gallup both saying the same sort of thing about consumer confidence. So that, on the whole, is clearly a bad message for John Major. Is that, is that attributable to the budget, in your opinion, Peter? Well, Gallup, I mean, on Gallup actually had pretty, a pretty difficult poll. The last, they made well themselves a bit of a rogue poll. But nevertheless, even Gallup, in a, in a, in a poll that was very good for Labour, su suggested that a third of all the people asked thought that the budget had made them worse off. Not better off, or not left them the same, but actually worse off. So he, the budget doesn't seem to have done the Tories much good. So, Geoffrey Archer, what shots are there in the locker? You've seen the opinion polls, you see the feel-good factor, which did look as if it was going your way, and now clearly doesn't look as if it is. And then we've had today's inflation figure, which suggests that interest rates may have to go up. How do you think the Conservative Party and John Major can fight out of this? You've talked about disunity in the party. That presumably goes without saying, but what else can they do? Well, that, that doesn't go without saying. Let's say that first, that if we pull together, we have a chance. If we don't pull together, we don't. You mean if Secondly, they just shut up on Europe? Uh, uh, if the no, sceptics shut up I on mean, Europe? I don't want to get into... I mean, I'd rather answer your question. Answer, I don't want to get into Europe. Anyone who pretends the Labour Party aren't divided on Europe are living in a dream world. But that's your... They had a motion split, against it? Blair, uh, one of Blair's uh, amendments last year, where 79 socialists voted against us. We know they're just as divided on Europe. But that's the split it's, you're referring to. It is indeed yeah. the split I'm referring to. I, I think we should allow the Prime Minister to go to these negotiations with the chance to negotiate, not have his hands tied behind his back. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you look at the inflation figures, which are very low, and you look at the growth figures, which are three, three and a half percent, if you look at unemployment falling every month, one can only hope that during the last six months before a general election, people will weigh up whether they want to return to a Labour government, a Labour government who are now claiming their new Labour, in fact it's awfully hard to find out what they actually disagree with with the Tory party. I mean, I'm sitting opposite a man who voted against the releasing of British Airways into denationalisation and now goes, I doubt if he would nationalise British Airways again because the year he voted against it, it lost 747 million. This year it made 623 million. Uh, they're not going to reverse anything well, we've done. If they're not, they're new new debt. But hold on, but, but if, if they're new Labour, if they're new Labour, that may be the very danger to you. People are fed up with you, you've been there 17, 18 years, and out of your own lips comes the words that they're not going to do much different. Well, so, so maybe it's time to give question. John Prescott a, a chance to say question. good evening. I think, That's sorry. <laughs> I think he's doing it for us, isn't he? Listen, over 100 of the Tory MPs have now indicated that if the government in any way identifies a single currency, they're going to make clear in their manifestos, their own individual manifestos, they won't support it. 
this government will be split right up to the election. It can't offer leadership. It's got a party that can't be led, and that's their real difficulty. Jeffrey admits that. That's their real problem. I can't see it changing, and I think here we're not 50% in the polls. I don't think it's as high as that. Tony Blair constantly saying that, uh, you know, don't be complacent, but 44%'s the area you win elections in, and that's where we'll be concentrating and putting our case. Chris Davis, does this uh, good result for the Liberal Democrats in this election suggest that your worries about the Liberal Democrats getting too close to Labour aren't actually well founded, that Paddy Ashton is playing the right game by tipping the wink uh, to the electorate that if it's close after the election the Liberal Democrats will be there four square with Labour? I think people want change. Unquestionably, they want to see the back of the Conservatives. But I don't think they can place any trust in Labour. I don't think that's uh, there by any means. After all, the Labour Party are simply saying, we want better education, better health, and all the rest of it. They're not saying how they uh, are going to pay for any of these things. We're being honest Who's and making clear that we want to see these things, and we're saying quite clearly where the money's going to come from. What's good for us is not the, uh, the national opinion polls, but they're in our target seats, in those areas where we are our best place to win, where we have a good base in local government. Our um, our proportions are, are very much higher. In November, for example, there was uh, um, more than 40 local by-elections across the country. So you've no criticism and of the Liberal Democrats going into the next election, actually letting us know that if it comes to it, they'll be prepared to go in with Labour? I don't because know what you mean by going in. I mean, there were some... There, there were some I, 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 I'm, I'm fighting the next to election. Go get nice seats in the Cabinet. I, I and my colleagues will be fighting the next election to win votes and seats for Liberal Democrats and we'll be using the position and the influence we have to try and put our uh, policies and principles into, into, uh, into, into choice, uh, really. practice. But the reality is that uh, I think uh, anyone who thinks that we're going to get too cosy to Labour should just recognise the very real differences we have with Labour, which I think are spelt out very clearly in the House of Commons. But we think, the we the think day, they're betraying fundamental civil liberties, we think they're being dishonest about tax, and we think that uh, in office we're going to be uh, just as critical in many ways as we have been of the Conservatives. Okay. With them last time. Is, the, is the psychological damage of being at zero after all these years in office going to actually psychologically disturb the Tories? Is John Major going to find it difficult in the next weeks to go to the dispatch box and answer questions with the kind of confidence he had in 92 when he won the election? No, I don't think that, because in the, the reality in the House of Commons is that if you look at the votes over the last six months, you'll find that most of them were won by 2021. It's very, very <coughs> rare for it to be close. They'll have to set up, as uh, John so rightly said, have to set up something. The Ulster Unionists will be with you or somebody else will be well, with you right through. Well, 20, if you look at the votes, it's around 2021 every single night. They will actually have to set up something. That doesn't worry me. I still believe the election will be in May. Okay. But the real Gentlemen, worry, the worry we're over with the government is the substantial decay about it. It's disintegrating. <laughs> yes. 17 Thank you, ministers yeah. of Thank you resigned. very much indeed. <laughs> we have to end there. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Peter, too. And from the special edition of the Midnight Hour, the no surprise Barnsley East by-election. Good morning.